Hi everyone, I'm Susan Birch and welcome to another A Health Detective podcast. I'm very excited today to have as a guest Vinnie Tortorich. He's been in the, in the health and fitness industry um, longer than I have, which is quite a long time. Vinnie is the original trainer to the stars and he was one of the early advocates for a lower carb diet that he called No Sugar, No Grain. I think you can see that on his hat. And he used that to get all his stars in shape. So we might be able to ask him some questions about that. He's a best-selling author and he has a very popular podcast called Fitness Confidential, which I found a few months ago and have been enjoying. He's the producer of three excellent documentaries. So Fat One and Two, and then the latest one called Beyond Impossible which I highly recommend that everybody has a look at. He lays out what's been going wrong with the food industry for the last 50 years and how the lies we're being fed are making us fatter and sicker. Vinny, thanks so much for coming. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into this business and working with Hollywood elites and making movies? <laughs> Susan, uh, first off, it's a pleasure meeting you. Um, it's amazing how technology allows people like us who are half a world apart, literally. And, um, you know, we, we're just talking, this is like Jetson stuff for me, you know, whenever this kind of thing happens. Uh, as a matter of fact, I visited your beautiful country. I was in New Zealand in 1987. I think I was there. I landed in Auckland. I went through the whole North Island and uh, went to Rotorua. Um, and then went to South Island, you know, just, just did the whole thing, went to Milford Sound, saw the sounds. What a beautiful place. What a wonderful place to, to live. Uh, have you been there your entire life? Yes, I have. And I live in a beautiful little town and just outside of Rotorua. So about 40, 45 minutes, an hour away from Rotorua. And it's just encased in this beautiful valley with trees and forests and parks and a river running through it and a population of 6,000 people. So it's just living the dream, really. Yeah, that is dreamlike. But uh, it, it is amazing that we're able to do this sort of thing. Uh, you wanted to know a little bit about me. Uh, just listening to you talk about me just now, I was like, wow. You know, whenever people introduce me, he's done movies, he's written books, he leaps tall buildings in a single bound. It, it really does sound like they're making it up. Um, it sounds like that to me, and it's been my life. Um, but I've been very, very lucky. Um, I, I, you know, I started training people 40 years ago. Uh, well, I, I walked into a gym even longer than that. It was 50 years ago. I was, I was, I was probably nine years old when I walked into a gym. <clears throat> I'm going to be 60 this year. So it's been a long time. And the reason I was, <laughs> I was even in a gym is because I, I didn't, you know, I was kind of this outcast kid and this local guy in our neighborhood, gyms didn't exist in 1970, the way they exist now, you know, people had them in a garage, you know, it was kind of like a ham radio, like a guy might have a ham radio, talk to another guy in Japan on the other end of the earth and gyms were the same way, you know, guys had a few plates and some barbells and that was it. And our neighbor, you know, family friend, I grew up in Cajun country down in Louisiana. And there was a small group of Italians down there, I'm Italian, and a friend of my mom and dad that they grew up with, he was into fitness. And I was just mesmerized with this guy and he had these big bulging biceps and everything. And I, I knew nothing. Except that if you take something heavy, and you move it around, you too can have biceps just like Mr. Joe over there. And um, I was I, I was there every day, I was just fascinated. And he took me under his wing, you know, I was a kid that was a bit of an outcast, a bit of a nerd. And um, he took me and 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 molded me into uh, what turned out to be a, a really good athlete. Um, which is odd. Because my parents weren't athletes, they were nerds, they were both school teachers. My dad has a doctorate in history and so on and so forth. So it was unusual that one of their kids took to weightlifting. And then from that, 
I started playing football, you know, the real football, the American football, none of this, you know, footy as you guys call it. Is that what you guys call it, footy? We have soccer. rugby. We have rugby, rugby and rugger. we have soccer. We have rugby and yeah. soccer. Yeah. My wife is British and they call soccer footy and they call yeah. it rugby rugger. Yeah. You know, so American football, I got into that and, you know, just kind of went through the paces. I, I ended up playing in college. I got a college scholarship. And that's when things kind of took off for me because I, you look around and you go, well, what am I going to do in life? You get a college degree. Do you go do something you hate for the rest of your life? Right? What, what, what do we do? And they kept saying, hey, you're a pretty smart guy. Maybe you should get a law degree, become a lawyer. Hey, you're taking a lot of biology and kinesiology and you're taking gross anatomy and on and on and on. Maybe you should look at med school. And neither of, of those professions meant anything to me. I, I just, I couldn't imagine being an attorney. You know, it's like studying for the rest of your life, never going outside and playing. You know, you're constantly just reading. And doctor, someone's life in my hands? I don't think so. And all those sick people too, you know, you're dealing with sick people all the time. Yeah, they, they don't come to you when they're well. So no, I don't no. know if you've done that math. You know, my brother became a mechanic. And one day he was just so frustrated. I said, Mike, what's wrong? He goes, you know, people only come to me when their car is broken. <laughs> well, well, there you go. You know, people don't go yeah. to doctors when they're well, you know, they just go. So um, I was just getting a degree in, 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 in secondary education, with a big emphasis, emphasis on uh, physical education, because I was just interested in it. You know, I have a degree in exercise physiology, I have a degree in nutrition. So I was like the most overqualified PE teacher in the world. That, that's what it came down to. Um, <laughs> and when I, you know, I was already working with clients, you know, this is in the early days before trainers were a thing in the early 80s. I was helping people get in shape. And they were giving me tips, I didn't even charge, you know, they would hand me, here's 20 bucks, here's 30 bucks, you know, which meant a lot for an hour of work. In 1982, 83 is what is this? And then when I turned it into a business, the money really kind of started rolling in. I was like, well, this won't last forever. I kind of felt like a stripper in a strip joint. It's like, well, while I'm young, I guess I can make a few bucks with my body and then it'll go away. Right. So I was just living that life of training people and really enjoyed it because I was already in shape. I couldn't make me in more shape. You know, I was keeping myself in shape, right? But if I can get someone who's out of shape, I can do it again. Mm -hmm. right? I was really excited about that prospect of, I can help mold you, and you're going to pay me? This doesn't even seem like work, right? And uh, I kept doing that over and just, you know, kept getting clientele. And around 1991, after doing it for years and years and years, and I was also working in a school after school, I was running a, um, the strength and conditioning program at at one of these hoity toity private schools. I noticed kids getting fatter and fatter, young kids. I didn't see a fat kid when I was growing up back in the 70s. But all of a sudden now they're fat kids. And that didn't sit well with me. So, you know, one thing led to another and um, I just uh, I moved out to LA because I figured if I was in Los Angeles, maybe I could do something with children's fitness in a big way. Um, and that was my big game plan when I moved out there. But whenever you walk into Disney or Nickelodeon or any of those companies, and you go, Hey, guys, I have this great way of getting kids in shape. And they'll go, great, we need that. What are you going to do? I said, Well, we got to get them off of all of this sweets and all of these grains and all of this crap, we need to get rid of all of it. And they were like, yeah, not so much. Get out of here. You know, I, I couldn't sell it. I couldn't get anyone to buy it. So I was already out there and um, I started working. I don't know how I ended up with a celebrity clientele, but I did. And I did a really good job with them. And they just kept hiring me. And 
that's how you end up with the moniker, you know, celebrity trainer guy. Um, I wasn't the only one, you know, there were others. But it was it was a short list of guys and women who got the jobs, you know, to, to work with those people because they needed results. You know, if you have a, a movie coming up in six weeks, you need a result now, right? They can't mess around. Production's going to happen whether they're there or not. Yeah. So once they know that they can rely on a certain trainer, then you get job after job. After. So once you're in, you're in if you're doing good work. And by the way, if you mess up on one person, you're only as good as your last client. If you have someone who's not paying attention to you, that can really screw up your whole career. So it's not like a really cushy thing. You are only as good as your, your last product. If that, so did you, and, <laughs> you select clients carefully then or, or do you sort of just take whoever comes or, you know, how so, do you, how do you I, I, I didn't get that. Ask, ask again. I just wondered whether you had a client selection process in that case, you know, were you, were you careful about who you, who you would work with? No, uh, you, you really don't have much of a choice. You know, if, if, if an agent calls you and says, you know, like sometimes I'll give you an example, they'll call you and they'll say, listen, my client, female, uh, did a movie a year ago. In between movies, you know, th that's when they time having kids, you know, if they're married, if they want to have a family, they time it in between movies. So movie is done, they get pregnant, they have the kid, and now the movie's coming out and they have to go sell the movie. And they have to look as hot and sexy as they did when they did the movie to go sell the movie. They can't look like, you know, mommy just had a baby. And they would call me in and go, look, you know, this is cranking up in three weeks. And, um, you know, you, you got to get in there, you, you know, and I, I didn't have much of a choice. Either you take the job or you don't. Now, there are people who you don't take a second time, right? When they call again, you, you know, I'm, no, I'm passing, move, move along, right? And usually, if you're the second or third trainer that they're calling, that means other trainers have already passed. So if you're the second or third trainer they're calling, you're getting a problem child anyway. Yeah. You know, so, you know, it, so you, you take the good with the bad, but and, and look, I mean, every now and then you have someone who doesn't pay attention, they might be a drug abuser, an alcoholic or whatever. And they, you know, they know that the, the agents know that the studios know that. And you don't get dinged for that. Right? Yeah, they know that you were dealing with a mess. They were just hoping that you can clean their mess to and you know, they're, basically you're, you're polishing a turd, you know, and um, <laughs> I, I hate to use that term. But that's, that's what it is. Clean it up to a possible level. Yeah. 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 So, so you, um, you, you introduced on. the no sugar, no grain concept way back then. Yeah. Um, you know, I was doing that when I was in New Orleans also, you know, I was just pushing this whole idea that you can't lose weight. Look, Susan, my, my great grandmother from Italy knew that if you ate grains, you got fat. This was I'm not new information. My you mother know? knew that. Eat, eat bread and potatoes and you're going to get fat, you know? Yeah, you know, that was not new information. And all of a sudden in the 80s, right around the time that I, I started my thing, all of this low fat stuff started coming around. Mm. Low fat this, low fat that. And Literally, there were books written that said, hey, if you don't eat fat, you can't possibly get fat. And I was like, well, this is brand new, <laughs> nor will it work. I remember people walking into restaurants and they would just order like pasta puttanesca and it would just be a big mound of pasta with puttanesca sauce on top. And I would look around and go, where's, where's the protein? Is there any protein here? And and they were charging 18 and 20 bucks for that back in the 80s. And I'm like, you know, five cent plate of pasta with some tomatoes crushed on top. And this is it. This is you got to be kidding me. And I, I, people were telling me to my face, Oh, if you don't eat fat, you can't get fat. And I was like, Oh, contraire, you will get fat. Yeah. And, and they did. 
I mean, look what happened. I mean, the obesity epidemic started overnight, just pretty much overnight. We created a food pyramid. We put grains across the bottom and then grains and sugar all the way up and a little bit of meat right at the top. And we thought that this was a good idea. You know, eat the base of the pyramid as much as you can. Oh, really? I can have all the bread, potatoes and corn that I want? Are you kidding me? I still teach this at, at, at Otago University, you know, in nutrition class. This is still this is still what's been taught, you know? Avoid fat, eat seed oils, don't eat that dreadful saturated fat. Limit your protein. Let's have some fat, some protein free days. Let's have meat free days. You know? Yeah. You know, um it, it it makes no sense. You just gave me a note that I have to add for a podcast that I'm doing tomorrow. This is how I work. I do other people's podcasts and you remind me of stuff. Uh, so let me just write. Um, here we go. Um, so yeah, you know, the seed oils are basically an abomination when you think about it, right? We were never seed oils are, are they should be used as mechanical lubricants, not for human consumption whatsoever. Right. And yet people are eating it. I mean, this is a chemical you should not be eating. If if I gave you the lube that you would use to oil the chain on a bicycle, you would go, Oh, my God, that stuff. Oh, my God, it's hard. It does taste horrible. Yes, the seed oils are exactly the same oil. It is not different. And you go, well, why does one taste good? And the other one doesn't because they add perfumes, they add, you know, the clarifying, they do all kinds of crap to make it not taste like the crap that goes on your bicycle chain, but it's essentially the same stuff. It's engineered, isn't it? It's and, there's engineered. No, and there's no vegetables that have oils in them. No, they, they, they do, but not in oh, any okay. large... Yeah, well, avocados and olives, but yeah, not in any great quantity, eh? Right. But but by the time you, you steam it out and heat it out and press it and do all the stuff, you can get some oils out and you know, you just process it until it becomes this, this, literally a chemical that's not made for human consumption yet people will eat corn oil, safflower oil, canola oil, you know, sunflower oil, <laughs> soybean oil. I, I, I it's, peanut oil, I could go on and on and on. And it's all just horrible for human health. It is, but no one seems to care. Yeah, it's just in everything that we buy, it's in all our processed foods. And, you know, this obesity epidemic you were just talking about, that has hit New Zealand so hard. And I think we have the fastest increasing rate of childhood obesity in the world, which is tragic you know go back to your first point about you know wanting to help the kids just you know you know where do we, we, start? Just, we just came through what they were calling a pandemic you know the, the whole COVID thing mm -hmm. and yes a lot of people died worldwide and um it, it's a shame that so many people died but we have a bigger epidemic the obesity epidemic is killing as many people, it will, it's already killed way more people than COVID will ever kill, right? Uh, there will never be a shot for it. You can't wear a mask to get it to stop it to slow it down. You can't do any of the stuff, right? Um, all you could do is eat right. Yet, you don't see it on the news, you don't see anyone going, Oh, my God, we have an obesity epidemic. Oh, we, we need to stop this epidemic. It's a pandemic, people are dying all over the world. My God, you know, this is happening left, right and center. And by the way, the majority is finally coming out now, the majority of people who died during COVID had comorbidities. And those comorbidities were generally morbid obesity. Um, but no one was talking about that. You know, it happened to old age people who are very old, and comorbidities from fatty liver disease, type two diabetes, you know, you, you know, you, you go through it, you just go through it. And it, you know, it, it, it's not good. Those people did not have to die. Yet, you know, when you have all of these comorbidities, something slips in there, and that's what kills you. 
right? Yeah. Absolutely. When you think about, you know, when you think about AIDS, you know, we had the AIDS epidemic mm -hmm. back in the 80s through 90s before they came up with all the drugs to so that people can live with it. No one was dying of AIDS. They died of a comorbidity, you know, because their their immune system was compromised by AIDS. So, you know, if you get pneumonia or something, you're dead. Right? And, and people don't realize that's how we die. We don't actually usually die from that. We die from a complication. That's right? what's happening with COVID, isn't it? Well, no, they're yeah. not dying from COVID, they're dying from, they're dying with COVID from something else. Right. And nobody wants to talk about that. Mm. And it, right now, COVID has taken us out. You know what? The flu has taken people out too. It, it, with the same thing, you know, if, if a, a fairly healthy person gets the flu, they live, right? You take a couple of aspirin, you take a, you, you sleep for two days, you get the chills, you feel bad. Some people get, you weigh 450 pounds and your A1Cs are 12, you have fatty liver disease, you, your blood sugars are over 600, you get the flu, you may die, right? That's a fact. I mean, I hate to be the guy, the bear of bad news all the time, but these are all facts, right? And uh, that, that's why I'm so passionate about this stuff because I have loved ones, I have family members and everything else who are some of these people. And when COVID happened, uh, you know, my parents are very old. And I was like, Oh, my God, I hope they don't get it because it'll take them out. I very lucky so far they haven't and they're alive and they took their shots and everything else. But I have brothers who are morbidly obese. You know, they if they get COVID, they can die. Right? I, I have family members who are very close to me that that really it really worries me. So when people go, why are you so passionate about this? You're in great shape. Your wife is even in better shape. I mean, what, what are you guys worried about? We worry about family. We worry about friends. We don't want to see them die. We want, we want to see them live a, a healthy life. Well, how do you have an influence on those people, Vinny? How do you, you know, it's, it's very hard to help people change the way they live and change their attitudes to the food they eat it's impossible for me to influence anyone mm. it's impossible i can't it, it won't happen uh and you'll say well that's, that's hogwash why can't you do something well because you know when you know <laughs> if you're always hounding friends and family to get in shape and to get healthy and to eat right you become the guy that never gets invited over for dinner just a pain right. in you, the you, yeah. you lose yeah you lose the relationship so mm -hmm. you know you just bite your tongue you're already every time you walk in and you're in shape you're already holding a mirror up to them mm -hmm. you know the last thing they need to hear over dessert is hey maybe you should take it easy on that dessert they're already you know so it's it's a very difficult thing for a guy like me to talk to family and friends very difficult. Yeah, I, know, I, I hear you. I know where you're at and you just keep your mouth shut and do your own thing and hope that people will make a choice themselves to make some changes and, and, and do it a bit differently. Yeah, yeah. But I think we've got I think we've got a huge problem with the media and I know over here the plant-based thing is is absolutely huge. We have all our, our meat companies and our dairy companies are now getting into this fake meat and fake dairy produce. And veganism is really increasing. And I can just see that being even more of a catastrophe, you know. Well, veganism never takes hold in a big way, not as big as we think it is, you know, people, you know, they go, Oh, wait, vegan, I can have bread. Okay, I'll be a vegan, you know, like most people don't know what veganism means. Um, um, yeah, the meat, you know, that's why I did Beyond Impossible, the movie. Because, you know, I looked around in Cargill and, um, and Tyson Foods and all of these big giant worldwide meat conglomerates were dropping not millions but billions with a b into the fake meat meat industry and i'm like well, wait a minute why are the meat people dropping because you know they 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 have their ear to the ground they see what's coming down and 
they just they want to be on the forefront, right? They just want to be on the forefront. And you can't blame them. They're just there trying to do what they can do. Right? So I don't, I don't begrudge them that, right? They're just trying to, you, you, the corporations will make figure out a way to make money. So you don't blame them, you have to blame the doctors. And, and by the way, when you look around, you have Walter Willett at Harvard. Have you seen the movie Beyond Impossible? Yeah, I have. I've watched it a couple of times. It's very good. Yeah, it's, um, you know, when I did that, when, you know, I started looking down, just looking through everything and taking deep dives. And I was like, well, why would Walter Willett be saying this? And it's like, well, he gets paid by, you know, these companies, <laughs> the, the big food companies pay him. This, folks, this is not me coming up with a conspiracy theory. This is not hidden. You can just go, this information is out there. You can just go see this information. Um, that's why I tell people, anytime you see anything coming out of Harvard University here in the United States, don't believe it. It's been bought and paid for. You know, you, you, we all want to think Harvard's this noble beast, right? That's just you know, giving us the best information. It's literally giving us the worst information, which is a scary thing, right? And I asked Walter Willett to be in my movie, he turned me down. Um, I asked um, Dean Ornish, the guy who was the nutritionist for one of our presidents, Bill Clinton, he turned me down. And did he, he did fork over knives? Was that? Yeah, he did. Yeah, he, they, they, he did. He was in a bunch of those, a um, bunch of those vegan propaganda movies. You see, I was I wasn't, you know, vegans make propaganda movies, I was trying to make a movie where I had both sides. So I asked vegans to be in my movie. I wasn't going to do anything. I wasn't going to take their words out of context. That's not who I am. I just wanted their side of the story. Mm. Honestly, and I couldn't get one to show up. Um, Michael Greger, who calls himself Dr. Michael Greger. Uh, last I checked, he never got his um, medical license. So but he he wears the stethoscope around his neck in a white coat. And he calls himself Dr. Michael Greger. And um, I, was, I was fascinated in your movie because you know, we see a lot of him on YouTube. And I was fascinated in your movie where he said that he had never practiced as a doctor, he sort of qualified and then he went out and started brainwashing all the other doctors. Yeah, he, his uh, he, uh, the, the truth is stranger than fiction. And you heard it come out of his mouth. Yeah. And by the way, he was being interviewed by McDougal, another vegan doctor, right? You folks, you cannot make this stuff up. Um, so McDougal goes, you know, I, I've been yelling on my podcast for years. Michael Greger is not an MD. He, he at best, he can call himself a PhD because he went through medical school he never did his residency, right? He never did rounds at a hospital. He never did anything. He, he, got, he got a PhD. And according to him, after all of that education, he decided, hey, instead of becoming a doctor, I'm going to become a doctor who trains other doctors. Okay. How does that make sense? How do you make a living doing that? Uh, my, my skills, my skill set is much better suited to go help other doctors. But other doctors are going to look at you and go, wait, you never spent one day in clinic. How would you know what we know? Why would we listen to you guy who's never done anything? It, it, none of it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I, Susan, I'm not making this stuff up. I mean, you saw it in the movie. I mean, oh, it, 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 came, just, it came out of his own mouth. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and then uh, there was another thing. I, I'll never forget this. Um, you know, whenever we, um, you know, whenever you do a movie, the attorneys, you, my attorneys have to go through every frame and make sure that everything is the truth and all this stuff. And, you know, there's this guy, London Real, who was interviewing Michael Greger, and he goes, well, you pulled a clip out that made him look like a kook. You, you made the guy look like a complete kook. And I said to my attorney, I said, here's the whole interview. I want you to see if I cherry picked anything out and 
they called me back an hour later and they said, okay, we're good. This guy's a kook all the time. You know, he, he wasn't being a kook for 30 seconds. Yeah. He's always crazy. And but, by the way, he refused to refuse to answer any questions about the value of eating red meat, wasn't it? You know, he was, you know, I hate people who eat red meat. <laughs> yeah, he goes, I, 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 I only cherry pick the, the, the data that's available. <laughs> what? what? What does that even mean? I, I only mean, cherry pick the data that's available. Actually, you don't. You, you know, and my favorite, and, and I hate to just knock on this guy, but it, it is, he makes it easy to because, you know, he he has books that called, um, and one is called How Not to Die. And he, he wrote that when he was maybe 40 years old. And when you when whenever you show any picture of the guy, it's not like he took one bad picture, take any picture of the guy and show it to anyone and go, how old do you think this guy is? And they'll go, I don't know, 60. And the guy was like 39, 40, 40. I think he's like 47 or 48 now. And he literally looks like he, and his new book is How to Live Forever. And it looks like he's going to die any day now. You know, he's feeble. And again, I feel like I'm picking on the guy. He's feeble. He has low pencil neck, his arms, there's no muscle, there's nothing. He's fading away because he's got an eating disorder called veganism. That's the, that's the book he was writing when he wasn't able to come onto your documentary and, and answer your questions. Yeah. That's one of my favorites, Susan. Um, um, I asked him to be in my documentary. The first thing he said was, we need to, you know, we can't just go on anyone's documentary. You have to reach a certain criteria. How big is your audience? And we said, well, what's your criteria? And they sent us criteria. And we show that in the movie, we beat the criteria easily. Like it wasn't even, we just stepped over the finish line and said, here, we beat your criteria so you can be in my movie. And then he goes, well, I'm busy that day. And I said to Megan, my assistant, I said, did we give him a day? She goes, no, we just asked him to be in the movie. I said, I need to see the letter we sent to him. And then we put all that in my movie. It's like, these guys are saying, Oh, yeah, I can't do it. I'm busy that day. And there's no day. Mm -hmm. It's just would you like to be in a movie? When you call Nina Teichel's and say, Nina, would you like to be in my movie? She says, Yes. You call Gary Taubes, would you like to be in my movie? Yes. You call Gary Fetke down in, in uh, Tasmania, would you like to be in my movie? Absolutely. They don't go when is it? How do we do it? What, what? They just go? Oh, yeah, yeah, we, we would love to be in you call a vegan. And all of a sudden, they're the busiest human beings on the planet. So yeah, why, no what one could be that? in my movie. What, what is it that they're scared to answer? What is it that you might ask them that they are worried about? I don't know, because they won't talk to me. I don't know. Um, I wasn't going to ask those guys any different question than I asked Nina Teichels or um, Dr. Mitlerner or uh, Frederick Lacroix or any of the other people that were in the movie. Um, Dr. Tony Hampton was in the movie. I was going to ask the same 12 or 13 questions that I asked them in the movie. Um, there was one person who I had extra questions for, I think it was Dr. Mitlerner, because his skill set was more about climate change and, and gases and CO2 gases. So he had a few different questions than everyone else, right? Obviously. But I wasn't going to ask the vegans anything differently than I asked anyone else. Yet they were, and, and by the way, I've asked, I, I've put a call out to all, not, you can't just be any vegan, you can't just be Joe the vegan down the street. But if you are, are credentialed, and you want to come on my podcast, I'm willing to have a real conversation with you. Um, but the first question is going to be, if there are no exogenous vitamins in the world, how would a vegan get vitamin B12? And if, yeah. once you answer that successfully, we can move on to another question. I'd probably move on to how do you get enough iron? How do you get all of the amino acids? Because the best protein, pea protein in the world will not cover all the amino acids you need to live. Sorry. Sorry. You, you just can't. And so many other 
bioactive substances, you know, all those micronutrients, you know, how do you get enough retinol, you know? I mean, you can just go through this very long list. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I don't know, it's, it, they, they won't come on because those questions can't be answered. And they can try to give me some BS answer like they do in their videos on YouTube and everything else. But the difference between me and a YouTube video is I will have a follow up question. And I will have a follow up to that follow up and a follow up to that one. So Walter Willett he walk he take a supplement, didn't he? he? He just said, Oh, you might need a B12 supplement. Um, you may possibly you may possibly be iron deficient and B12 deficient. I mean, not possibly you're going to be. Yeah, there's no way to if you're eating a real vegan diet, and you're not getting exogenous exogenous vitamins means, you know, they've been extracted from something else, and you're taking them by themselves. Um, otherwise, you cannot be a healthy vegan. I'm sorry. You know, and some so, of them go on. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just going to say, what always confuses me, or the question I have, is how are the amino acids that you get from meat and the same amino acid that you get from plants different? Why is the one from plants healthy and the ones from meat not healthy? What's the difference? They're, they're both healthy. Um, the difference, that's a very good question that no one ever asks. The difference is the profile. You know. Um, amino acids work in conjunction with each other, right? You've heard stuff like branch chain amino acids, right? That's like four or five amino acids that in a branch chain work together synergistically. You've heard of essential amino acids, right? They work synergistic. Um, so in animal foods, um, you get um, all, all amino acids, including eggs, you get all amino acids in their purest form in the right combination, right? When you take a, a plant protein, you might only get half or two thirds or one third, depending on the plant and what it is, right? You'll get some of them. And now things get janky, because you know, if you're eating a lot of I'm just going to make up some a ton of carrots, you're not just getting a ton of sugar, carotene, or, or anything else you might get from it you might only get a few amino acids. Now you're getting too many of those amino acids, and none of the others. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, leucine is one that we know, don't we from, you know, from the fitness bodybuilding industry, or even just from general health, that, you know, that's the limiting amino acid for muscle protein synthesis. So if we're not getting enough leucine, we can't build, we can't replace muscle, you know, we can't build muscle. And, you know, we know we need two and a half or three grams of leucine each bolus of food that we eat. So, you know, where are you going to get that out of your plants unless you're consuming thousands of calories? And not only, you know, it's funny because bodybuilders will always know is, yeah, leucine, you know, you do need to, to get a, a proper amount of leucine, but it's not just the leucine, the part they leave out because, you know, they, they, you know, they swim in their own pool, right? The thing that they're not telling you is you can't just get leucine by itself, you need a proper amount of leucine, but it needs to be mixed with the other branched chain amino acids, right to work properly. Yeah, and, you know, and that's, that's something you, you know, even if you found one vegetable that has leucine in it, you can't go, well, I'm gonna eat a whole bushel of this. Number one, who wants to do that? And number two, it's not mixed with the proper amount of other you know, branch chain mm -hmm. amino acids. So you, you end up with a problem. Mm -hmm. Bottom line. And then we have and then we have a similar problem, don't we, with you know, they're limiting amino acids for making your digestive enzymes and the limiting amino acids that you need for making your neurotransmitters. So, you know, eating meat has solved that problem because we evolved to eat it, our DNA recognizes it, and it's got everything that we actually need in it. Yeah, you know, and look, that's why I included this woman, Lear Keith, in my movie, you know, she was a long term vegan, mm. um, who started eating meat at some point. It was the closest I could get to a vegan was a former vegan. And um, 
she, you know, she's been on my podcast a few times. She was like, look, you know, I was a staunch vegan. I lived it to a T. I think from the time she was like 12 or 13 until she was like in her 30s. And she almost died. She, you know, her teeth were falling out, her hair was falling out. You know, she could barely stand up anymore. Um, you know, cognitive thought patterns were crazy, you know, just crazy thought patterns and couldn't really do a whole lot. And one day, just out of desperation, she she ate meat and almost instantly started to feel better. You know, it's amazing how quickly your body will come back if you eat meat. I've heard that story so many times. Yeah. Um, I've read her book, The Vegetarian Myth, if anyone's interested in reading that. Great story. Um, I, I laughed. I had so many laughs. You know, she, she tells an excellent story, but also very sad. Yeah, um, you know, was I was there any hyperbole? I, what I just said was pretty much what was in the book, right? Because yeah, I, I used, yeah. I was paraphrasing, but that's pretty close, right? She was losing her teeth, her hair. Oh, you know, she, just was. Kind of, she was losing her mind. Also, she Oh, and she was trying to grow her vegetables, you know, in the beginning, she's talking about how she's trying to grow these vegetables. And then the um, caterpillars and the, you know, the, the, um, moths and things and butterflies were eating them and so she's collecting these and you know she's collecting these and taking them out into the forest so that she doesn't have to kill something and then they started not thriving and so then she had to look at fertilizers so she went to the you know the plant shop and they wanted to sell her um fossil fuel fertilizer and she's like well yeah. i can't use that and she lived fairly close to a poultry farm so then she had to overcome this like, well, now I've got to get organic fertilizer from the poultry farm, but I'm really opposed to the poultry farm. And right. she started to really question her own judgment. And she said, in the end, she said, we have to kill animals to live and it doesn't, you know, and it's sad and we need to learn to do it in a better way, a humane way. But at the end of the day, everything kills something else to live. And that was pretty much the basis, the end of her st you know, story. Yeah, you know, she says it in the movie, you know, um, every time you crack the ground, you're killing something. Yeah. You know, and anyone who thinks that you're not, you know, the hubris of some of these vegan zealots who go, oh, well, we don't kill on purpose, we kill by accident, right? Um, you know, I was in, um, I was in, in England for Christmas, as I am every other year, we go there a couple of times a year. My wife is, is British. And um, so I, I never, you know, I'm, I'm a hunter, and but I never get to hunt when I'm there. I mean, it's just never right time. And it's the whole thing. And um, her brother, who's a he hunts as much as I do more than I do, he's way into pheasant hunting and, and the whole deal. And he put together, he got me onto one of the hunts. And uh, it, it was such a beautiful thing, you know. And of course, PETA and the, the vegan society has a problem with this. And I said, Okay, well, what's the problem with this? And it's like, well, you know, they bait those fields and they seed those fields year round. And uh, then you guys come in and shoot the birds. And first off, it's not like we're walking around shooting birds on the ground, right? It's a sport. You, you have to have a skill, you have to be able to shoot basically a duck that's flying very fast above you very high. Um, you know, and that's not easy to do. Um, but they have a problem with all this. And I said, Well, okay, they have a problem with factory farming. So when you put a chicken, when you put a hen in a cage, they have a problem with that. Because the, the bird had a horrible life, it lives in a cage, and then it dies. In this case, we let the animals run free and have this glorious life. And one day while they're flying along, they die. You know, a shotgun hits them and they die. Isn't that a wonderful way to go? And the food is consumed. So where's, where's the downside with that? And the vegans will say, and PETA, well, you had fun doing it and that's not right. Now, now they're the thought police, right? 
they they're telling me how I'm supposed to feel when I'm killing a bird. Now I've killed chickens, I've, I've chopped I've ringed the neck and chopped the heads off and done all that. Right? It's, um, it's, it's better to go out with a shotgun in the field and shoot a pheasant. Trust me on this. And they go, I, I, well, I, what? I grew up in a hunting family. We lived in very rural New Zealand, and our meat supply was all wild pork and venison. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we all learned to hunt. But we were taught, my dad had enormous respect for the animals. And, you know, there was no going out and wounding and, you know, there was enormous respect and reverence for the animals and that they are, they provided our family with food. And if we didn't have that, we would have been a pretty hungry bunch of kids, you know? Yeah, you know, I, I've never understood looking at hunting as being some kind of brutal thing. It's how man has survived for millions of years. And um, mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of it. Um, and by the way, it's an industry where people get to not only eat, but it's an industry where people make a lot of money. I mean, that hunt I went on that day was not cheap, right? Mm -hmm. You pay a lot of money for this. And that supports the industry so they can seed fields and keep these birds up for another year and do all this again. Uh, you have people beaters, you know, they beat the, the trees, they, they go out and they beat the trees. You have other people with dogs, you know, that's going to grab your bird once you shoot it. And um, at the end of the day, you're not only are those people getting paid to be out there to beat and to, you know, to collect and do the whole thing. At the end of the day, they come up to you, you know, and you tip them and you tip them well, this is how they feed their family on these tips on on the salary they get. And by the way, at the end of the day, they said, How many of your birds would you like to keep? We had 30 something. And I said, Oh, we'll take four or five home. Um, so please clean four or five for us. And they, they're waiting for these magic words. The rest is yours. And the smile that comes on their face whenever you tell them you're getting 25 birds to put in your freezer. Yeah right? This, this is more than the tip and everything else, because this is feeding their family for months on end. So months on end. Let's contrast that with the final clips in your film. So you dealt with this very topic in, in the film, um, yeah. you know, deliberately shooting animals or killing animals to feed ourselves versus the accidental killings. And the final movies were the hunters, were the, the shooters, I forget what they were called, out killing all those pigs. And that was just, that was tragic because that's not going out and killing like my dad did, kill a, you know, shoot a deer, take it home, dress it and we eat it and then you go back when you need some more. That was just mass slaughter of these yeah. pigs so that they wouldn't eat the crops so that the vegans could then have their cereal and their rice and, and, and feel good about themselves. Well, yeah, you know, yeah. vegans, you know, th there's two arguments vegans will make. Um, one is, well, yeah, you know, there's is not intentional, but a combine can run over a mouse. That's what they always say, look, you know, we get it sometimes a rabbit or a mouse, you know, unintentionally dies. Sometimes it's not sometimes when those combines are going through a field, and I showed footage of it, yeah. by the hundreds, these animals are just being trampled by these machines, by the, th the hundreds and hundreds and thousands, right? Uh, to the point where buzzards just go along the side of the combine and pick from what was just spewed out. Um, every day, a combine will take in some cases, two buckets, two five gallon buckets, so 10 gallons of dead frogs out of the wheat that was just laying in the wheat because they just, frogs just get chewed up in that, right? And, and, and some, you know, I've read, I saw in your movie, but I've read elsewhere that quite often these animals are just munted up and, you know, they're, they're in your cereal that you're eating. Yeah, it is. They, they can't get it out. You know, if yeah. it's a whole frog, they, they can, it, 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 the yeah. machine will catch it whenever. 
but most of them get mangled. So, you know, pieces and parts go in, mice, rats, everything else. And that's all in your cereal, folks. Sorry, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. And then, um, yeah, the, the shooting. And, of course, you know, one guy was critiquing my film. He goes, uh, Vinny, you know, if farmers really care, they can put fences around, you know, their wheat and their soy. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Number one, it's not cost effective for these guys to put up hundreds of miles of fences around their farm. And the fences would have to be 12 to 15 feet high. Um, and by the way, wild animals that want to get to food will get through those fences. I'm sorry. It, you, you grew up rural. I grew up rural. Animals will figure out a way in. They will burrow, they will, they will rip it open, they'll do whatever it takes, they're okay. getting yeah. in. Yeah. Bottom line, okay? You can't cage an animal outside, it, it, it just wouldn't work. So what these farmers have to do, uh, so that their crops are not decimated, is they go out undercover at night with assault rifles. These are not the pretty Woodstock looking rifles that your dad had in the whole thing. These are assault rifles with um, night vision goggles and all this stuff. And they go out every night and shoot thousands of pounds of pigs and, and uh, deer. And the problem is, is that, as you know, when you kill an animal, you have to dress it pretty quickly, right? And you have to get it on ice pretty quickly. You can't go knock on someone's door at two in the morning and go, hey, would you like a thousand pounds of hog? Can we just drop it off here? And then you could do that one night where you're going to get that same guy the next night. There's nothing you can do with this. So these animals just die. It, when, I was, when I was cutting the film, that was the most brutal part. I had to sit there and watch that over and over. The footage I didn't put in was way worse, by the way. You know, I tried to keep it to where you saw what was happening. You know what was happening. But the brutal brutal murders I saw of animals that were just shot. And what, what you don't know is they go out the next day with a, a big front end loader and they just scoop them and throw them into a dump truck and they just go dump them somewhere. That's, you know. It was a very powerful ending to it. Yeah, it, it's very wow. sick and very sad what goes on. They undercover every night, they go out and they shoot thousands and thousands of pounds of meat. And then they scoop it up the next day and just throw it away. I don't know whether they, my numbers are, are right in my head, whether I, I'm remembering correctly, but I'm pretty sure I read somewhere that there's something like 72 million animals killed a year and, you know, in this monocropping. I, I don't know. I, like, I, I don't have that stat, but it's not a small amount of animals. Mm. A lot of animals die. It, it's very sad. Um, and all of those animals could live if we just stop making grain. Look, I, I grew up in the deep south on the sugarcane. Most of my camp family were sugarcane farmers. And one of the things we would do is when they cut the cane in the field, they would burn the leaves off of the cane stalk in the field, right? So they wouldn't have to carry all that crap to the sugar mill. And uh, so they would go with a tractor and a big torch and they would just start burning the cane. And um, you would just hear, you know, first off, rabbits would come running out. So we would just walk alongside. And when the rabbits would come out, we would shoot them and bring them home, you know. But after you kill 10, 12, 15 rabbits, you go, okay, if I kill any more, I got to clean that many more. It takes a long time to clean that many rabbits. And you have homework and all that kind of stuff to do when you're a kid. So we would kill somewhere between 12 and 15. Okay, we can get these cleaned. We can skin them, get them to my grandmother. She can do the rest that kind of thing. The part that would always disturb me is you can hear the ones that got trapped in the fire squealing, squealing as they burn to death. So think about that, folks, every time you eat sugar, that rabbits burn to death, and not just rabbits, rats and everything else, you can hear them squealing in the fire, they couldn't get out. So why don't, so why don't those animals matter? Why is it only the cows that matter? And the shape, you know? Don't know. Be, because you see, these are questions I would have asked in my movie, but I couldn't get them to show up. Mm -hmm. 
I, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't get it. You know, I, I wanted this answer more than you, Susan, but I couldn't get anyone to show up. You know, there's so much contradiction, isn't there? Because they don't want us to kill the cows and eat them. And yet, you know, and they, you showed this very well in your movie. And again, the words came out of Walter Willett's mouth and the other, and the other people's mouths is they hate cows and they want the world hmm. to be devoid of cows. So what are we going yeah, to do? Um, the, what are we going to do with all these cows if we stop farming? If we stop eating them for meat, a farmer's just going to have to look after them until they die a natural death. And, so, you know, and the uh, other thing I want to point out is, sorry, interrupt again, but I'll let that's you okay. speak to this. Was I had never thought of this before? Was about the cows in India, and they're not used for food, you know, and and that'll bring us into the environmental aspect. But anyway, I'll let you comment on those. Yeah, I, I don't know what they expect. Um, one of the guys, uh, Mr. Brown from um, Beyond Meats, said, "Yeah, if it was up to me." Uh, cows would be extinct by, I think he said 30, uh, 2030 or 2035. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wait a minute, did he just say this once? And was that just, and then we, we found three or four other times, I, I, I put two times in the movie, I, I, I couldn't just put all four of them. Yeah. You know, yeah, I went, wait a minute, did we just hear that? So I found another time and put that in. I, I like doing those fun things in movies, because it keeps people interested. And um you know, the truth is stranger than fiction. I, if you're asking me where the cows are going to go, I, I don't, I don't know. You know, they worry about other animals becoming extinct because I see their commercials on television. They're very worried about the polar bear and the ice caps melting, but they want to see cows go extinct. And how would the Indians feel about that? Because it's sacred in India. I, I spent a month in India. They love their cow, you know? So, so I don't really know what the answer is from their side. They would like to see some animals not go extinct and other animals should go extinct. But now we're talking about PETA and PETA doesn't make sense. People for the ethical treatment of animals. You know, if you read their bylaws, they think that you should open your door and let your dog run outside and free him because you have him enslaved right now. So if you have a dog, Susan, you need to go let them, it out. I've got two of them and they are it, it, right now because they're in their crate. So they won't make a noise while I'm talking to you. Well, listen, if I, if I open my door and let my bird dog go outside, he would just see a squirrel or a bird or something and run out into the street. He'd be dead in five minutes. Mm -hmm. But according to PETA, um, we're enslaving animals and we need to let them go. And um, so you need to go over and open your dog crates, open your front door, and let your dog do what it will. Uh, and hopefully, uh, they'll make it through the night. You know, but that, that's the world we live in. I wish I was making this stuff up. I'm not. Dogs really like this, but they prefer the sofa that they sleep on to sleeping outside in the, um, in the cold night air. Yeah, no, my, my dog sleeps in bed with us. You know, it's... Uh, you know, if I kicked him out of the house, he'd be, whoa, 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 what are we doing here? <laughs> What's going on here? The Why grass might there? be wet. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get my feet. supposed to sleep out here. There's no air conditioning and heat out here. What are you doing? <laughs> mm. My dog thinks the whole world is 76 degrees or 68 degrees, whatever we keep the house doing. <laughs> Always perfect. Uh, you'd go well with my two then. My, yeah. Mine are big Rhodesian Ridgebacks, you know, 50 kgs each, and then they don't want to walk on the grass in the morning because it might be a bit damp, you know? <laughs> big wimps. I love Rhodesians. Um, my dog, uh, I have a Vichela, which has a little Rhodesian. Oh, animal. very similar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very similar dogs. Um, mm -hmm. I'm on Vichela number three now. I've, I've had over the past almost 30 years, I've had three. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. They're lovely dogs. So similar to the Rhodesians. So nice natured, aren't they? Yeah. 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 She was just, uh, he, he was just barking. I don't know if you heard him a little while ago. No, no, no. Oh, he's getting, there he goes again. No, I he's, can't he's busy up there talking, probably talking to the neighbor's dog. Yeah. So with these animals, let's, you know, touch on the environment because 
I forget who you had in the movie to talk about that, but there's so many misunderstandings about, you know, methane, CO2, the environment, the dam- you know, the damage that cows and other ruminant animals cause. We, yeah, I had Frank Mitlerner on, who's an expert, um, but the vegans don't like him because he's an expert that actually knows stuff. Yeah. And uh, why let an expert talk? Mm. They just go, hey, he's dumb. Okay, what does that even mean? Um, but yeah, Frank Mitlerner, you know, uh, methane, as we call it, you guys call it methane. Um, methane it does not work in the atmosphere the same way as other you know, CO2 carbons, right? It, it has a very short shelf life, like eight or 10 years or something. The stuff that comes out of the tailpipe of your car and the stuff that's coming out of coal factories, and what have you that's lasting 1000s of years. And since it's lasting 1000s of years, and all day, every day, we're pumping more up there, you know, we're causing this, this, this global warming effect, right? So yes, folks, I'm not a denier global warming is actually happening. But unfortunately, vegans, cows have zero to do with that. As a matter of fact, we had more ruminants in the United States back when we had buffalo back uh, in the turn of two centuries ago, the 1800s. We have more buffalo roaming this land uh, than we have total cattle now. And we didn't have a problem back then. The problem didn't come until we we started combustible engines and uh, firing up coal and everything else. You know, modern civilization is ruining the planet, right? And the same people that want to see cows go away won't put their cell phones down, right? Yeah. That takes energy. That energy comes from it doesn't come from a little battery that you get from electricity. That electricity has to come from somewhere. And that energy source is usually diesel or more likely coal. So stop it already. It has nothing to do with cattle. No, it doesn't have anything to do with cattle at all. It's an interesting dilemma. And when you look at, you know, when, when you go to the supermarket here and you look at all the exotic fruits that have been flowing in from all around the world and um, you know, that's going to have far more impact on the environment than buying local, you know, home growing farmers markets and decent meat and some vegetables. Yeah, look, when I was a kid, there was a season for everything. In the fall, you got apples. In the spring, you got Vidalia onions and tomatoes. Uh, in the summer, you got peaches and on and on and on, right? Everything kind of had a season. Uh, cherries, you know, there was a cherry season, a strawberry season for a couple of weeks or a month or two every summer, a watermelon season. You know, so the grocery store only had a couple of different fruits and vegetables, depending on the season. Now we pick the stuff, we refrigerate it, it's free on, and we ship it worldwide. You know, most of the time you'll look on the fruit here in the grocery store and the vegetables, and it'll say it came from Chile. And that's nowhere near the United States, right? That had to be flown halfway around the world to get here, right? And it's all because we're greedy and we want to have apples year round and strawberries year round and berries year round. And it was never supposed to be that way, you know? So yeah, it's a problem. And it's the same problem we have with the fake meat industry, right? Most of the stuff is produced in China. And uh, then they have to use either jet A or fossil fuels of some sort to fly it here. And then we assemble it here in factories, we're spewing more crap into the atmosphere. And this is all coming under the heading of fake meat is better for the environment. Well, I don't see it that way. I see a lot of stuff getting spewed into the environment. Sorry, it's just a fact. And what about fake meat being better for health? We haven't even really, we talked briefly about the protein and some of the vitamins and minerals, but, you know, why do people who don't want to eat meat want to eat meat? Is it really aimed at vegans or is it really aimed at omnivores hoping to convert them through guilt? And you know, I don't really know. I, I, I've always felt like 
it's aimed at at omnivores and carnivore yeah. people to get them to cross over going, oh, if I can have something that just tastes like meat, I can just go away from mm. real meat. And what's in this that, stuff? You know so well what's in this stuff. Yeah, it's it's just a, a bunch of crap, a bunch of soy crap and you know, just everything else. And they put something called heme in it to make it bleed and look like, you know, it, it's just all this the stuff that they mix together. And I mean, literally, when you look at it, a, an Oreo cookie is healthier. And I'm not trying to be funny. Um, you might as well just be eating Oreos. I You're actually, not eating anything healthier. I, than I that. actually did the comparison of that. And there's actually not that much difference between them. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. Um, they use um, pea protein and all this different kind of stuff. But it's so bastardized. Mm. you know, that you're looking at it going, it's a chemical, you're putting a chemical in your body. Do you really want to do that? I don't and think when so. you look at meat, you know, what's it got in it? When you look at some vegetables that come out of the ground, what have they got in them? You know? Yeah. Yeah, Just it's chemicals. There's tons and tons of chemicals. So what about these global elites? You spend a little bit of time in the movie talking about how, you know, we've got Walter Willett from Harvard, we've got this Eat Lancet, whatever it is, planetary eating guidelines, um, and some various other influences. Do you want to just talk briefly about those and the impact that they're having? And it all just comes back to money again. Yeah, you know, it's a lot of people with money um, that are trying to push their ideals on everyone else. And, you know, look, we we had a system, a great system of checks and balances for, you know, most, well, my entire life and before that. And we used to break up monopolies in this country, you know, you couldn't just monopolize stuff, you know, and now you have you know people like Bill Gates and some of these other people who have all amassed billions and billions and billions of dollars, and they're calling the shots, right? And they own the media, they own all of the social media, and they can push whatever they want out there. Right? Uh, this is not a good thing, because you only get what you know, people will get lullaby, it'll be just lulled into this whole, okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it says to stop for a second. Um, so all the way into my, um, you know, my maybe my 40s, my, my, my 30s, definitely, I probably had 30 phone numbers that I had in my head. You know, if I wanted to call my grandmother, I had her number, all my brothers, my friends, I didn't have to think about it, they were all in my head, right? You have these combination of what is it? Uh, four, seven, uh, nine numbers for us, right? And different combinations, right? And that was most of my life, I probably had 30, 35 of them in my head, most people did. Yeah. yeah. Now, I barely know my wife's phone number. Mm -hmm. Barely. And the I only reason I, I know her. Number. Yeah, most people don't know their own phone number. They you know, when you go, I, I want to get in touch with you, you can't remember your own number. You, you go, let me just share it. You see, it's AI, let me just share it, right? Um, and the only reason I know my wife's number is because at, when I go to the grocery store, they ask to put a code in. And the code is her phone number. You have to put a phone number in. And I want to get the discount when I go to buy food, right? So I have her number in my head. But that's about it. I couldn't tell you my daughter's number. I couldn't tell you my parents number, my brothers. They're all just in the phone. I see their name and I press a button. I press on their name, not even a button. You know, that's where we are. And, you know, these global elites are doing the same thing. Hey, sit back. Don't think don't do anything. We're going to handle everything. Right. And when guys like me or Nina Teichos or Gary Fetke or Gary Taubes, or Tim Noakes, whenever we say something about it, it's like, Oh, no, 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 no. Don't don't pay attention to those people come back over here. Pay yeah. attention over here. It's, it's, we're not heading down a good road. No, 
because you guys are all paid by the meat boards or something, you know, which is not true. According to them, there's some fancy meat organization that's paying me to say this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I wish at some point that that check would show up. Because well, I'm, there, I'm there with you because I get accused of the same thing. And I'm like, well, I'm still waiting for the, I'm still waiting to see the money in my account. Mm. Yeah, I keep hearing that my movies are bought and paid for by the meat industry. Yeah. I would beg these people to come and make my next movie because I come out of pocket every single time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're funding these all yourself. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. No money from anyone else. Um, that's kind of a lie. Um, because what I did was I crowdfunded the first movie. So a bunch of people gave me $5 each and we got like a quarter of a million dollars. Yeah. And that's how we made the first one. And even at that, I had to put a lot of my own money into it to finish it. Yeah. And when the money came back on that movie, I felt like I had other people's money. And I had no way of handing it back to them. Right. So I went, well, I'll bet they would like me to keep that somewhere between $5 and $50 that they sent me and use it to do another movie. So that's what I did. I did the second one. And then that money came back. And I went, man, I keep trying to throw this money away. And it comes back. But you see, I never feel like it's my money. So I've been using house money to make the next movie. I call it house money. Have you got another movie in mind or do you feel like you're done with the movie business? Uh, I don't. Uh, well, I, I keep thinking about other stuff and people start coming to me as if to say, hey, you're the guy now that makes movies. We have this great idea. And like, I've thought about doing a few different things, but uh, I don't know. Um, it takes so much to make these damn things and and like I just said, I'm not really making money on them. <laughs> you know, I take a few bucks here and there just to, you know, it's like, well, maybe I can go out and buy myself a steak, but you can't, you can't earn a living. You can't make a living off of documentaries. I'm, I'm very lucky that mine do very well. And I'm able to make all the money back. Most people make documentaries and never get the money back. I'm at least getting the money back and I'm able to go make another one. Hey, there's one other thing I wanted to talk about before I forget, and then I'll regret not talking about it. Um, Game Changers movie. You just reminded me when you were talking about other documentaries. That's been huge over here, and I hear I have had so many people send me the links to it and tell me, you know, that this has been mind-altering for them. Can you just go through, you know, just a couple of the myths that were presented in that and people can then watch your documentary to see the rest of it. Yeah, um, you know, I, I knew that it was coming down the pike. I've never seen the whole movie. Um, I've seen bits and pieces of all of it. And I, I knew what they were doing. And you know, they, they were talking about these fantastical feats that athletes were able to do after they became vegans. Except all of the parts that I saw, I was able to debunk, which, you know, for one, you know, I, you know, I looked at it and, um, well, they had the guy and they said, well, this guy's the strongest man in the world, you know, and um, he's a vegan. And I looked at the guy and I went, wait, I know I, I've always paid attention to the strongest man in the world competition. I've never seen this guy in it, the guy with the funky looking beard. I've never seen that guy nor is he of the ilk of someone that can be in that competition. Th these, these men are very special, right? Most of them are from Norway or Reykjavik or Greenland or somewhere crazy, these big Nordic types, and then they work out like animals and they're just different than regular human beings. And I'm looking at this guy and they're going, he's the strongest man in the world. And I'm going, no, no, not so much. So I went down the rabbit hole of trying to figure out who this guy was. And it turns out he had never been in the strongman competition. He's never made the roster to even try out for the competition. And so I went, well, how can they call him the strongest man? That's just an out and out lie. It turns out that he won 
strongest vegan at a vegan fair in a Texas in a town of about 600 people or 2000 people or something. He was the strongest vegan that day in that competition. But they leave all of that out in the movie. They just go, he's the strongest man in the world. Right? They, they lead you to believe that you're looking at one of the strong. And by the way, the competition that he became the strongest man in is not sanctioned by any other strongman competition. So they he created a competition for him, yeah, from what yeah. I can tell. And then I, I, I wasn't happy with that. I wanted to know I was like, well, he is still pretty strong, right? And so I looked into it. And you can find most high school weightlifters are stronger than this guy. He wouldn't even win a high school weightlifting competition. So I hate to be that guy that does that, but that's just one guy. And then there was another woman. They said, oh, she's an Olympic champion or something. You know, they alluded to the fact that she's the best 400 runner in the world. So I went, oh, she must have won the gold medal. No. Oh, she maybe, look, maybe the silver, not even the bronze. Um, as a matter of fact, she didn't come in fifth. She didn't come in eighth. She didn't come in 10th. She didn't come in 15th. She didn't even come in 20th. She came in like 23rd or 24th. Okay, now, look, I couldn't make it to the Olympics in anything, right? She at least made it to the Olympics. But let's face it, they take bobsledding sledding teams from Jamaica. All you have to do is show up. If there's no one else in your country running it, they'll let you in, right? She did make the team, but she didn't even make it onto television Olympics, you know, it was like, she was ousted long before they even got to the television rounds, right, where you get to see the real champions. And, and I could go on and on and on. Yeah, you know, everything in that movie was like that. I mean, she was, that, she was an amazing looking young woman. And, and I can imagine that lots of people would look at her and think, gosh, I wish I could look like that, you know, and yeah. that would, you know, and if I eat vegan, well, maybe I can look like that. But that's not really, you know, she's got the training, she's got youth on her side, which is something that and, and genetics, she has and genetics. genetics. Yep. And, and people forget about, you know, sort of youth and the hormones and how things change as we get older, too. Yeah. And look, I would like to follow someone like that for five years or 10 years and see how well she's doing. And then yeah. do we know how long she was a vegan before the Olympics? Do we know whether she kept it up after the Olympics? And I have read different accounts that some of these athletes in there actually gave it up and went back to eating meat. So they usually do 87% go back within a few months. Um, yeah, yeah, we you know, they just drop this hand grenade and they walk away, you know, it's like, yeah, they're all vegans and they're great athletes. Well, no, and we don't, you know, this woman was obviously a good, you know, that there, there was a uh, prima ballerina from France years ago, um, named uh, Sylvie Guillaume. And Sylvie Guillaume, um, the vegans were going to see, she's a superb athlete, as, as ballerinas are, she's a prima ballerina, she's a superb athlete, look at her body, she's amazing. And she's a vegan. And I'm so happy that Sylvie came out and said, hang on, most of the time until maybe the last year of my, my reign as a prima ballerina, I was a meat eater, I became a vegan for ethical reasons. And it had nothing to do with my athletic ability. I applaud her for doing that. It's like, Oh, you're going to take her she became a vegan five minutes ago, and you're going to blame her whole long, illustrious career on veganism. No, you can't do that. She was a meat eater. I'm so glad she came out and said that. You know, we need more people like that. Yeah, honest and, and speaking the truth. So yeah. James Cameron was the producer of this of the game changers. And then you point out his connection with the pea protein industry. Yeah. 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 Uh, James Cameron, um, his wife um, is a staunch vegan. Um, I cannot confirm or deny, but I know that James Cameron is not really, maybe not really down with the cause, but that's just between us. I, I don't know that to be true. Uh, I'm not saying that, hey, he's lying, he eats meat. I don't know. 
I really don't know. Um, but through some Hollywood people, people that have worked on the sets. I've heard some, some stuff that when his wife is not around, things may happen. Um, but I can't confirm or deny that. I'm just, I'm just, we're just having a, a conversation here. Um, yeah. But yeah, he dropped $34 million in a pea protein company and then produced a movie talking about how great pea protein is, you know, and he got Arnold Schwarzenegger, his friend to be in the movie. And Arnold Schwarzenegger is a, a drug abusing meat eater. <laughs> Everybody knows that. <laughs> yeah. And that's not a lie. We, you know, he's never lied about his abusing drugs to be a bodybuilder. That's a fact. Or, or how much meat he eats either. Yeah. And eggs and everything else. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So for everybody listening to this, I'm sure they'd love to just have a couple of tips from you about what can they do to improve their health, you know? They're not maybe elite athletes or movie stars, but what can they do to get a bit better body composition, get rid of their type two diabetes and start feeling a lot better about themselves? First and foremost, and I'm not saying this, do not go, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, better sleep, get good rest, rest matters. Uh, number two, you can not outrun a bad diet. So correct your diet, get off of all seed oils, get off of um, processed foods altogether. Um, you know, eat real whole foods, you can have vegetables, you can have red meat, you can have pork, chicken, fish, you know, eggs, are amazing dairy, for the most part, some people can't have dairy, uh, you have to figure that out on your own. And then exercise, exercise is a poor way to lose weight. But exercise is the fountain of youth. Um, you want to kick sarcopenia in the butt that's muscle wasting as you get older. Um, you, you have to move. It's a use it or lose it proposition. And do you have any preferences? Do you like cardio? Do you like strength? Do you like a blend of both of them? Do you like slow, long, slow? Do you like, you know, short, sharp, fast? Do you have any preferences for that or a mixture? Yeah, um, you know, you should have a combination of uh, LSD, long, slow distance, you know, zone two training. You know, you keep your heart rate between 70 and 80% of your aerobic capacity. I don't care how you do it, you could do a rowing machine, a, a, a treadmill, a, a stair machine, indoor bike, outdoor bike, jogging, walking, it doesn't really matter, you just have to do it. And I always tell people it's like brushing your teeth and wiping your butt, you know, we don't have to do that, but it's good habits to have. Mm -hmm. um, and then some sort of weightlifting is always good, you know, lift heavy things, you know, you let your body do what it was made to do. And then after you do those things rest. That's the important thing. Uh, I'm not a big fan of hit. You know, high intensity interval training will get you hurt really fast if you don't know what you're doing. And you will get adrenal fatigue. And you know, your, your thyroid could go off and everything else if you just do it every day and just hammer away at that stuff, it'll eventually get to you. So you have to take care of yourself. Yeah. And last question, I keep thinking I need to respect your time, but I keep coming up with these other questions. <laughs> and while I've got you here, it's wonderful to get your opinion. I want to talk about obesity, accepting being overweight as normal and fat shaming. Do you have any thoughts and ideas about that? It's such a sensitive, emotive topic. And how do we how do we address obesity without attacking people and making them feel, you know, ashamed and, and, and lowering their self-esteem and self-worth even more? Yeah, um, I don't believe in fat shaming at all. Uh, I've been working with morbidly obese people for 40 years. And um, I've never known fat shaming to work. It just doesn't, it's stupid to even consider that fat shaming is a good idea. Um, so yeah, it, you can't fat shame someone into shape. Um, but uh, I don't like that we're normalizing obesity. You know, I saw a, co a cover of Pos Cosmopolitan magazine where they had some morbidly obese 
women on the cover in bikinis, and they were going, this is the new healthy. No, it is not. That is not the new healthy. You cannot be morbidly obese. The word morbid is in the title okay. of what we're talking about. So we, we can't normalize this, right? And say, you know, we have this, uh, this rap, this uh, female rap star in this country, this beautiful woman named Lizzo. And she's, she's wider than she is tall. And she wears bikinis and all this stuff. And go, you got to be happy and proud of your body. And it's like, yes, you do. But I don't, I don't want to hear that Lizzo is healthy because she's not, you know, uh, if, if she's healthy, I want to see her A1Cs, I want to see her liver profile, I want to see her, her, her blood work in the morning, right when she wakes up, I want to see where she is. And if you can prove to me that she's healthy, when she's morbidly obese, and I'll back off. But that's never happened in history. Right. So fat shaming, I'm completely against. I feel I feel bad for these people. I work with these people. I want them to do better. And I'm so proud when they try and they're working at it and they get better. Right. But to normalize it is never going to help anyone. So you'd be a you'd be in favor of checking, you know, metabolic markers and things like that as a means of feedback as to what their health is like rather than you know because we all come in different shapes and sizes and that I mean sure. that's, obvious, that's obvious so you know I mean I find in my work that that does provide some incentive for people without needing to talk about sort of being a beast or fat shaming and then talking about you know how do they take care well how do all of us actually how do we all take care of ourselves without abusing our bodies by doing too much exercise and doing hit every day and, you know, excessive fasting. And, you know, that's as big a problem, I think, as the other extremes. So, oh, I, I couldn't agree more. People always say, well, what do you have against fasting? It's like nothing, nothing. I really don't. Um, but people are using it for hacks and trickery and all, you know, I hate when people, I have a body hack. Yeah. I, I don't want to hear about your hacks and your trickery. There's, there's, there's a right way to do everything. And, um, uh, you know, it makes me sound like a curmudgeon, uh, which I'm, I, I probably am. But it, it's, you know, facts are facts. You know, you're not going to change the facts just because you feel a certain way about a fact. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. Curmudgeon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they call me Grand Torino on Twitter. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, but they go, oh, here's Gran Torino again. And um, oh, I love yeah, it. it's, it's funny. I, I guess I am. An, I sit on my front porch in a rocker and y'all get off my lawn. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Would you like to tell everyone where they can find you? We'll make sure that we share all the links in the show notes and I'll be encouraging everybody to go and watch your movies. Please, folks, don't try to find me. Leave me alone. Uh, <laughs> you go to leavemealone.com. Um, and you can find me there uh, yelling at folks. Uh, VinnyTartarace.com is the best way. I have a free PDF there. You guys can go and download and look at and do all that kind of stuff. It's, it's completely free. It's not clickbait. It's not, hey, now you got to buy something. Uh, so you can go check that out at VinnyTartarace.com. I'm on Twitter every day. I answer questions there, um, even though they're shadow banning me. If, if you get through, I will answer your question. I have an Instagram, you can go there. Uh, my movies are on 70 VODs around the world and a lot of great airliners. I remember somebody sent me, hey, I'm on Malaysian Airlines heading out of Bangkok or something and your movie is on and they, they take pictures of it. But I'm, I'm in 70 VODs around the world. But Mainly, I'm on Amazon in most countries, iTunes in most countries, um, um, Vimeo in most countries. And then if you're in some other kind of, you know, no matter where you're in the world, you can find, where did you find my movie, by the way? I went and looked for it because I found you, I, I was searching for, you know, people who would make great guests. And I found your podcast just before Christmas. 
And then that got me introduced to the movie. And so I bought it off Apple TV. So that's where I got it. But I yeah, think Apple it, TV is it, yeah, it's another place. Yeah, Apple yeah, I think you can get it on YouTube as well. Um, yeah. yeah. So, hmm. yeah, you get you can buy it on YouTube. You can buy it almost anywhere you could buy a movie. So, um, and people always say, why don't you make a deal with Netflix? Or, and this is the final word, I promise. Um, people always go, why don't you? make a deal with Netflix or Hulu or one of those. And the reason being is, is once you make a deal with those guys, they can pay you a lot of money and then bury your film. If, if there's one vegan there that doesn't want people to see it, that's in the upper office, they'll go, yeah, we gave them a couple of million bucks, but we're going to just bury it. No one will ever see it. Mm. I'd rather sell my movie the way I'm selling it, where people seek it out, they find it, and they go and they get it. Oh, well, I'm, I'm pleased to have done my bit and supported it. I think it's great. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much for your time today. And I hope we'll, I hope we'll get a few downloads from New Zealand. And I really appreciate your, you know, honesty and talking about all these topics, helping to get the word out there. Uh, Susan, thank you for having me on.